So uh, I guess today I, I, I requested some backup as this is a very uh, technical uh, uh, topic. Uh, yesterday we covered uh, some of the basic topics of load pole, uh, waveform engineering, harmonic, basic fundamental tuning, things like that. Um, Today we're going to really look at uh, uh, more advanced concepts of, uh, you know, um, of harmonic tuning, not just on the output, but on the input, look at waveform engineering uh, more in, into detail. Um, and for that, we, we basically um, uh, asked um, uh, the help of uh, Dr. Tushar Sharma, who basically has uh, done lots of work with us in the past years. Uh, so, so there's, you know, Tushar wasn't alone on this. He had a, a whole, you know, team working with him. Basically, he did some, uh, some work with uh, Sagardar, uh, Professor Fidel Ganucci. Uh, also, uh, uh, you know, an acknowledgement to Damon Holmes at NXP, who was very instrumental in, 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 in this work. Uh, so, you know, uh, I've worked with, uh, with Tushar quite, you know, a few years now, and he always has these concept, advanced concepts that he wants to to do and push the envelope of load pull. And, uh, you know, if I go back a bit in time, uh, you know, I'll say probably like 10, 15 years ago, uh, you know, the concept of waveform engineering was kind of still in its infancy. And, and people were like, you know, they knew it and understood it, but, you know, it was far from being into implemented in the lab. You know, some people would kind of look at the waveforms and, and would do source tuning, harmonic source tuning and things like that. But nobody really grasped the concept of how that was really behaving at the device plane, at the waveform, in the waveform domain. So, uh, you know, it was more like, oh, I'm tuning the, the fundamental impedance at the source. I'm seeing some sort of behavior. And then when I tune the second harmonic impedance, oh, I'm also getting some better or some worse performances. But nobody could really, really understand this like you know uh, adequately so uh you know tushar really tackled this topic and, and in this paper will he'll go really into the details of of how to improve improve the the, the performances of an amplifier uh, so on that note tushar the stage is yours hey uh <clears throat> thank you vince for uh, for the introduction and it's my pleasure talking today uh to people all around uh, europe uh, so this work has been uh, was my PhD work, which was basically done in collaboration with the NXP semiconductors uh, and Focus. Um, I also have on call Sagar Dhar, who is a PhD student who is finishing his PhD. So a part of the research is part of his PhD as well. So I will be walking through uh, the fundamentals and then how we utilize the fundamental mathematics and uh, understanding to validate these advanced concepts. Uh, using using a harmonic load pool. So uh, to start with, uh, we know that power amplifier classes uh, broadly, depending on harmonics, we can classify it into two types. Uh, on the left, uh, the uh, we see uh, if our higher order harmonics are short, then depending on the bias, we have been defining classes of operation like class A, AB, class B, and class C. Now, uh, if we start playing with the harmonic second or third, uh, then things change. And then class J, class F, inverse class F, depending on the combination of harmonics, whether second is short or second is open or vice versa, different classes of harmonic tuned PAs uh, can be defined. So just to be clear, even for harmonic tuned PAs, there can be different bias points. There can be a class A bias class F or a class B bias class inverse class F. But the point here is that uh, broadly, uh, if we start moving our harmonics, the definition mostly fall into the right hand side where we have class F, inverse class F, and then there are some new uh, classes of operation uh, which was published by us like class GF and GF minus one. And uh, if you see the trend, uh, depending on waveform shaping, the idea is uh, to shape the waveform at the drain uh, with minimum overlap between voltage and current uh, so that we can maximize the efficiency. So I will be walking through some of these advanced classes, starting from the fundamental classes, and then we'll be showing how we validated these classes and some advanced concept using uh, harmonic load pool. Next. So uh, going to the fundamentals, uh, the we we, uh, uh, we guys are aware of a conventional class A amplifier where we have a, a full sinusoid voltage waveform and a current waveform. And uh, in class A amplifier, there's a maximum overlap between voltage and current. And as a result, uh, the efficiency is quite low and the maximum efficiency we get 
under class A amplifier is around 50%. So the class A amplifier is mostly used for um, uh, linear uh, applications uh, for like example in audio amplifiers. Uh, it's a relatively a linear amplifier with low efficiency and um, uh, it has been uh, discussed uh, quite extensively in the literature. Uh, so moving next, uh, if, if we change the bias condition and bi bias our device under class AB bias of operation, the major thing what happens is that the voltage is still the same but the current clipping starts and my current conduction angle basically varies from 180 degrees uh, to 360 degrees between that and my efficiency can can go any we can swing any anywhere between 50 percent to to uh, 78.5 percent which is the extreme end of class a b or deep class a b which we also call as class b amplifier so uh, moving next uh, the most uh, popular class, uh, you know, which we have been working around, uh, have been uh, used quite extensively in advanced modulation architectures are mostly like class AB and class B bias. Uh, in class B bias, uh, the current waveform is half sine, which means that uh, my, my current uh, waveform has um, <clears throat> uh, the even harmonics uh, and my odd harmonics here are basically, uh, I have no odd harmonics in my current waveform. And the voltage is still same. So from class A, class B to class AB, voltage has always been a sinusoid wave, but my current waveform changes. And current waveform is also changing in a way that my conduction angle is changing. And due to that, my overlap changes in all these classes. So with this, the maximum efficiency we can extract in a class B mode is around 78.5 theoretically. We can, we, uh, we can compute it based on the current harmonic components. So from this, bias dependency uh, of uh, of the conventional classes we we move into more advanced classes now like for example class f now class f uh, is uh, interesting like if if you take a class f which, which has infinite harmonics uh, then it means my uh, even order harmonics are short and my odd order harmonics are open so if we design that kind of a class f amplifier we technically uh, are aiming for 100% rain efficiency because there is zero overlap between voltage and current but practically speaking, those things are not valid in the real world. And we cannot do much above three harmonics, uh, especially, you know, now the frequencies are moving up uh, from 1.8 to 2.6 to 3.5 for such six gigahertz applications. So um, we can limit our voltage and uh, the voltage is defined as given in the expression here. Uh, and the voltage is kind of a square-like voltage, uh, limiting it to three harmonics. And my current is still the class B current, uh, which is half sinusoid current. So current is half sinusoid and the voltage is square. And by doing that, we further decrease the overlap between these two waveforms. And I can hit theoretically up to 90.6% efficiency. And interesting thing to be noted here is that if you calculate, like since we have the Fourier coefficients for voltage and current. So for example, in this case, my fundamental voltage component is two divided by square root VDC minus VNE. Uh, and if we divide it by fundamental current, which is like IM over two. So uh, if we calculate that, we get ZF naught as 1.15 times ZFV, which means that when we have changed harmonics, our fundamental has also changed from the optimum class B or class B R op. So now my optimum fundamental impedance for class F is 1.15 times R opt of class B. So any given harmonic when we change in load pool, the fundamental gets impacted. And as a result, we have to uh, change, the, uh, um, uh, change, the, uh, change the fundamental impedance. And here, ZF0 Z is actually Z1L, which is the fundamental impedance. Z2F0 is second harmonic and Z3F is third harmonic. So next. Now, inverse class F is very interesting uh, amplifier. If we uh, consider, it's a very interesting TA mode because uh, we are limiting up to three harmonics. And when we limit up to three harmonics, we are still considering that my current, because second harmonic is open, my current doesn't have any second harmonic component, but it can still have higher order harmonics like fourth harmonic, fifth harmonic, sixth harmonic, and so on. This is not an ideal inverse class F definition because ideal inverse class F considers all even harmonics to be open. But in this case, what we are saying that because Practically, it's only feasible to control up to three harmonics. 
we are keeping second harmonic at open and we can derive this i uh, current component um, by using technique shown in the paper which i have mentioned in the slides and uh, if you see carefully the current waveform actually does not hit i max unlike uh, class f where or class b where our current always hit i max my peak value of the current here is 0.7 times i am and volt unlike that uh, the, the voltage which is half sinusoid has a very high peak which goes up to 2.9 times vdd so inverse class f has a high voltage so it's mostly suit, suit, suited for uh, technologies where you have high breakdown voltages and once you keep second harmonic open our current also changes and current is significantly different than class b so if i again use the same idea of finding the what is the optimum fundamental impedance i will see that my fundamental impedance is actually 1.7 times of that of class b so because my current optimum current value is lower uh, i have a higher fundamental impedance which is significantly higher than class b and my second harmonic is open and third harmonic is short so uh, Inverse class of theoretically theoretical efficiency, uh, uh, if we use these expression, goes up to 91.07%, uh, which is among highest among the all. And uh, the optimum impedance is also higher. And remember, the voltage swing is very high. So it's mostly suited for 3.5 uh, technologies like GAN, where we, have, uh, where we have high breakdown voltages. Next. So, now, I mean, coming to the practical realization of things, um, since our device is not, again, an ideal device, we have a non-linear, uh, we have a, a voltage controlled current source, uh, which, which you are seeing in the, in the, uh, uh, in the center. Um, so, but apart from that, we also have non-linearity coming from the capacitances, like the train to source capacitance, CDS, uh, uh, gate to source capacitance CGS and the feedback capacitance capacitance CGD. So now what happens is that if we try to understand all the waveform engineering which convention conventionally people have, uh, just with respect to output, that I think is not uh, 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 complete. So the, because of the feedback capacitance, uh, there is a strong interaction which goes between output and input. So basically, we need systems where we can tune harmonics at the output mainly second and third and we need uh, and we uh, simultaneously we can also control harmonic at the input which is second harmonic source uh, at the input of the device so i will be diving more into how this output and input interaction uh, happens together but the but the whole uh, idea is that if we have an ideal sinusoid driving my uh, my device because of the nonlinearity which a gen which gets generated at the input due to the nonlinearity of the CGS, as shown here in the figure, the amplitude of the different Fourier coefficients at F1, F2, F3, and so on changes. Because of that, my voltage is no more an ideal waveform. My voltage significantly changes, and that altered waveform drives my, the gate of my device. And depending on what harmonic conditions I have at the output, I will be changing that voltage into current. So this is a kind of a systematic interaction of output at output and input harmonics, which will tell us whether our efficiency can decrease or our efficiency can increase because we have been doing load pull for a long time. And when we do second harmonic source pull, for example, we see that efficiency increases and then there is a null where efficiency will decrease and it will increase again. Similarly, at the output, we have seen second harmonic null at the output where efficiency increases and significant it, it will drop drastically and then it will increase again so we will try to dive more into these kind of things that why these happen and how we can have a better understanding of these concepts for high efficiency power amplifier design next so uh, typically uh, if we consider uh, the input nonlinearity uh, conventionally it has been avoided you know uh, by saying that second harmonic is short circuit and uh, we have that impression that anything ab apart from second harmonic short will decrease efficiency or decrease performance or there is an approach where we think that you know i don't care let the second harmonic at input be wherever 
uh, wherever it, we want it to be. And we are on the mercy of, you know, mercy of the God, whether the second harmonic will fall in right position, which can help us, or it might end up being in that null region where our efficiency decreases significantly. So what actually happens at second harmonic uh, at input, especially with respect to GAN is very, very important. And it kind of changes the way we think about this problem because uh, we can either increase or decrease the, the, the efficiency depending on how we terminate these harmonics. So next. So again, uh, why this analysis is needed, why second harmonic source analysis is so crucial uh, is because uh, we need to, we are moving to high bandwidth designs. We are moving to higher frequencies and uh, for broadband design approach, even if we consider that we are designing a really good second harmonic termination, but there are very high chances that over frequency, we might fall into efficiency null. And because of that, our efficiency will decrease. Similarly, uh, we have to understand that how this in input nonlinearity impacts the output or output impacts the input nonlinearity and vice versa. So that is something which we will be going through in the next slides. Next. So what is what actually is happening at input is quite uh, interesting because uh, so as a as a, we 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 feed like a input sinusoid uh, waveform at the input, and now unlike output, my CGS is very nonlinear at input, and due to the nonlinearity of CGS, um, it generates second order uh, mostly dominated by second order nonlinearity so if you see in this equation my vgs is given by vgs naught plus v1 cos theta plus v2 cos 2 theta plus phi 2 and here we are defining uh, which which uh, if you see uh, in the bottom equation is cos theta plus gamma cos 2 theta plus phi 2 so it's very important to understand gamma and phi 2 because i will be talking about gamma and phi 2 all through these slides so gamma is the ratio of second harmonic voltage to the second uh, to the fundamental voltage component it's the amplitude basically the absolute value of how much second harmonic nonlinearity is generated uh, at the input of the device divided by what my fundamental voltage is and phi2 is the phase difference between these voltage components so at input when we are basically uh, doing load pulling or we are trying to understand the phenomena both things are changing the gamma is changing which means the uh, magnitude of v2 and v1 is changing as well as phase is also changing the second order uh, the phase difference between second harmonic voltage and the fundamental voltage component so both of these determines basically what happens with my waveform and uh, if you see in the bottom figure, ideally I want a sine wave, but depending where my second harmonic source termination is, I will alter my waveform drastically. Next. So what actually controls this gamma and phi two? Uh, and this again uh, is related to our second uh, harmonic source pool, where when we are changing second harmonic source pool or we are doing second harmonic source pool, what we are basically doing, we are changing gamma and phi two. So what happens is that this gamma and phi two changes as a function of second harmonic source pull, and that impacts the waveform at the gate of my device. So if you see in this figure, uh, the gamma kind of increases up to 0.6, then decreases. So 180 is like kind of short, and uh, ideally it, it it uh, should be zero, like gamma should be exactly zero. Uh, but in, um, in, in practical world, the, the gamma kind of increases up to a certain point, say for example, in this case up to 0.6 uh, for some phase angles of second harmonic source and then gamma, uh, gamma decreases. And similarly, my phase, which is the phase difference from between second harmonic and fundamental, is 180 degrees for majority of the time, but it also makes uh, like a sharp increase and then it, it decreases. And this variation in phi two is also important to understand because this will change my waveforms and it will uh, change. If, if my gate waveforms are changed, it also means that when this gate voltage uh, con con uh, gets converted to the current, 
that will also impact my performance of the of a given device so next so one thing very interesting here is that it's not that gamma and phi 2 are always harmful for our designs the the way we control second harmonic source and that's why a lot of second harmonic source pull is needed to understand these concepts so depending on what your phi 2 is as i explained like phi 2 can vary between any it can be any number like theoretically it can be i can sweep it from 0 to 360 but in a practically in a gan given gan device it it makes swings from 180 to like 330 degrees and depending on that and depending on what my ratio of gamma is which is basically my ratio of again v2 over v1 the magnitude of v2 over v1 my gate waveforms can either expand or contract so for example in this particular case <laughs> the black curve is the case where i have no input nonlinearity which means my second harmonic source is short if my second harmonic source is short what i'm seeing here is that the in some cases for some gammas for example let's take a case of gamma is equal to pi or phi 2 is equal to pi so for phi 2 equal to pi if i see my uh, black curve and I see my red curve and compare both of them, they are significantly different waveforms. So gamma is equal to 0.5 here looks like that I'm driving my gate of the device from a square-like waveform and not a, a sinusoid, ideal sinusoid waveform. So what this will do, basically this will, if, if, if this voltage gets converted to the current, the red, red curve here will have a terrible efficiency because there will be more overlap between voltage and current at the output. And the black curve will relatively have better efficiency because the effective conduction angle of that waveform when it, it changes to uh, voltage, when it changes to current, uh, it will have a, uh, you know, the conduction angle will be smaller. And as a result, I will have a higher efficiency. So if you go next, this is what the next slides explains. Uh, that, uh, go back. Oops, sorry. That either conduction angle expansion or conduction angle contraction phenomena can happen depending on what my gamma and phi 2 are at the input of my device. So on the left hand side, if you see the conduction angle expansion phenomena, for ex uh, again, ex uh, the, the voltage here is basically co converted to the current. And if you see for gamma is equal to 0.5, my waveform has a higher, my waveform is broader. If my waveform is broader, it means it will have a higher overlap with my voltage. If it has a higher overlap with my drain voltage, my efficiency will be lower. On right hand side, if you see the, now phi 2 has changed. For example, in left hand side, my phi 2 was out of phase. On right hand side, my phi 2 is a different phi 2. And for that, if I compare, for example, the red curve, which is gamma is equal to 0.5, my conduction angle actually significantly reduces as compared to the black curve, which is ideally class B drain current where I have, uh, you know, uh, 180 degree uh, uh, conduction angle. Now for, for the same given bias, my actually conduction angle has reduced and my conduction angle uh, of the red waveform is significantly lower than the conduction angle of class B waveform. And similarly, if I see for another phi 2, there is a chance that <clears throat> that my waveform shaping happens at the input and uh, I again my effective overlap between voltage and current will decrease and because of that I will have a better performance. So setting the uh, basis of this idea of conduction angle expansion and conduction angle contraction at the input which is just dependent on the input nonlinearity and where you are biasing your device. So far we haven't talked about output harmonics or how output will change all these phenomena. But this is a basic understanding that how conduction angle and waveform at input will change and due to which uh, our performance will uh, alter and uh, we will have different results and interpretations depending on how we play with the output harmonics. Uh, next. So let's start with the fundamental and the basic idea which we all, which we all are well aware of. Uh, like class B. Uh, so again, applying this gamma and phi 2 idea. So let's, let's observe the curve on the left hand side, the conduction angle and the efficiency curve on the right hand side. So if you see, uh, we know that for gamma is equal to zero, which 
again repeating the gamma is the ratio of second harmonic voltage to fundamental voltage component the if you go on that axis you will see the conduction angle uh, this is the change in the conduction angle what i am plotting here uh, with respect to gamma and phi 2 that altered conduction angle is 180 degrees which means if there is no input non linearity which means gamma is equal to 0 i expect class b conduction angle to be 180 degrees so if you see the right hand side that point corresponds to 78.5% which actually i should have shown here but if you take gamma is equal to 0 on y axis and go to phi 2 of 180 uh, so this curve is 75 so that curve will be like 78.5% here yes exactly where this pointer uh, where vince is pointing out so that we that we know and we are well aware of but what interesting is if we move to the left part again and we start changing our gamma for for say phi 2 is equal to 180 you see our conduction angle expands from 180 to 220 so this is like a very bad region so if you again come on the right hand side similarly if we are on phi 2 equal to 180 and change gamma my efficiency tanks and my efficiency goes from 78.5 to 60% which all of us might have seen when we do second harmonic source pull this is a common phenomena which we see that efficiency we have certain efficiency then it suddenly tanks and then it will increase again at the same time if we go back again to the left curve if we have a phi 2 which basically is between 180 to say 360 degrees on the right hand side i can actually contract my conduction angle i can change my conduction angle from 180 to 170 160 150 and so on and on the right hand side if i see my efficiency i can actually have a higher efficiency than 78.5 so theoretically i can actually achieve 85 up to 85% efficiency at maximum efficiency condition in class b pm mode just one thing here the second and the third harmonic in this particular case is short so basically it's a tuned load amplifier where second and third are short and i am only changing input non linearity by fixing second and third harmonics at the output to be short so when we are doing it there is a beautiful correlation between conduction angle expansion and contraction and change in efficiency depending on what gamma and phi 2 my device uh, basically uh, have and that uh, my uh, gamma and phi 2 are coming from the non linearity of cgs so there is a possibility of having really really high efficiency in class b pm mode so now let's because now i mean we have tuners which are capable of simultaneously tuning second harmonic source as well as second harmonic load and third harmonic load at the output so what what uh, what's interesting to study here is that let's go to class f and class b so class b and f are very similar amplifiers the only difference between two is that third harmonic is open which means current is still the same but i have changed the voltage to a square like voltage and uh going back to the similar uh, analysis which we were doing in the last slide so let's if we see uh, class f at 180 degrees and i am changing uh, my gamma from 0 to 0.6 my efficiency tanks so from 90.6 theoretical efficiency i will enter into a very bad region which is like uh, you know uh, 70% or below that like uh, 65% and and people have seen this like in oops, oops sorry in class f we are efficiency delta is actually higher and uh, uh, and again remember that all this has been plotted for optimize uh, fundamental impedance that like whatever you do if input non linearity is there and even if you optimize your fundamental you won't be able to uh, regain back your efficiency <coughs> so class b and class class f their efficiency significantly tanks with input non linearity but then inverse class f which is very interesting here uh, is that you know you have complete immunity so if i am at 180 degrees and i am changing my gamma you know my efficiency doesn't change much from 91% to 89 and on the right hand side if i see i can still have some efficiency benefit i can go up to 92 94 that depends how much phi 2 is getting generated which is not in our hand because that is determined by cgs and the given non linearity of the device but the very interesting phenomena here is that inverse class f becomes immune to input non linearity 
and we didn't uh, i mean this is not very obvious but when we do advanced mathematics and we have like uh, lines and lines of codes uh, which we have written to understand these behaviors and fourier components uh, and you will see that we kind of uh, theoretically we can predict that inverse class f efficiency uh, will be uh, will be basically immune to any sort of input nonlinearity so uh, next so uh, vince are we good on time like how much time is left yeah we're 30 minutes in so we have time that's fine okay so now i'm showing uh, some practical examples of it because when we were doing all this theory uh, and again simulation tools are very complex like you know if you i want to do all this for example vince if you go back if i want to plot those kind of curves in like uh, use ads for them uh, it will take forever because that means that for every given second harmonic i am doing a fundamental load pull and then when i have a fundamental load pull i am trying to see what my second harmonic uh, uh, at load is and then fix that load and redo fundamental and then plot those efficiency numbers so that becomes very complicated and a tedious tedious task so we decided to validate all this uh, using uh, focus uh, go uh, next um, uh, harmonic tuners and the idea was again like to to basically um, relate our theory like our gamma and phi twos with the measured uh, performance and the waveforms so here uh, let's take an example of class b in class b uh, for a second harmonic and third harmonic short the maximum efficiency for class b is at a non short termination so short gives me 71% but there is a maximum efficiency point around 74.38 or 75% and then there is a minimum efficiency which is efficiency null which can go up to 44% so the the basic uh, I mean, the basic point here is that, again, what, what is happening here at the minimum efficiency point, my gamma and phi two are basically shaping the waveform in such a way that my expansion of um, conduction angle is happening and that significantly impacts my performance. At maximum efficiency, again, my gamma and phi two is changing in such a way that my uh, contraction of my uh, waveform happens and due to which, I have a better efficiency uh, and then there is a short case where my I have no harmonics uh, um, I mean no gamma and phi 2 and because of that um, my efficiency is basically uh, what I expect for a class B amplifier so if we are designing a short termination that is not the best possible ideal solution uh, for class B type of amplifier so moving next let's see class F um, again um, I mentioned this thing that in class F, we have, uh, <clears throat> sorry, it behaves more like class B. And uh, so here we are showing again, this is under compression. Uh, I have a case where it is short, maximum efficiency and minimum efficiency point. So at short, uh, I have some efficiency, uh, which is uh, around 88%. Then at maximum efficiency, it's around uh, 90, 91%. And if we go further, you know, there is a, this big dip, we just fall in the dip and we are gone, like boom, like efficiency is gone and we have really, really terrible efficiency. So, so what this is showing, and if you go on the right hand of the Smith chart, which is kind of a green area, efficiency is still bad. Like even if I, if I want to design in that region, that's a terrible region, considering if I'm doing like a broadband matching so for me the best region is what is highlighted in the red color here uh, that's the best region for design if i'm doing doing class f and the efficiency delta is quite significant up to 30 percent efficiency delta in class f so again the design has to be done very meticulously and the behavioral harmonics have to be studied in a nice structured manner and um, uh, one thing which i would like to mention here is that um, um, our theory predicts all this very accurately. If I take those curves where I was showing gamma and phi two variation and power and efficiency variation and maps them to a Smith chart, I can predict what this load pool is showing, which uh, we are also proud of because that is a lot of rigorous maths and some of our papers are that's why difficult to understand because it talks a lot about mathematics. But at the same time, our approach has been that we show some maths, then we have load pool as the intermediate step to match our maths closest to the device as possible using load pool. And then we go and apply those principles to design high power, high efficiency, high frequency amplifiers. Next. 
So now inverse class F, as I mentioned, is very interesting um, PA mode. You see, you have complete immunity. Uh, you do, you go and do a load pull. Uh, we have measured high efficiency as, uh, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, up to 90%. And if you see here, the efficiency immunity is significant. I mean, I can pick up any region here and I it, it will ensure me uh, that my efficiency is actually uh, uh, really high and my efficiency doesn't change much when I, I, I change my, um, uh, when I change my uh, second harmonic source termination. So this is something which is kind of uh, very surprising and uh, people uh, have a reaction to it that we don't expect this and it is happening. And again, fundamentally understanding this, when we have second harmonic open, any input nonlinearity of second order at input basically does not impact our performance that much. One caveat here is uh, that, uh, you know, we have to be careful that we, our fundamental impedance here is tuned to the, uh, not at R opt of class B, but R opt of inverse class F, which I showed in the previous slides is significantly different from R opt of class B, and it's a higher, higher fundamental impedance. So moving next. So now, I mean, I can, I can do so many things. Uh, we can have a full sweep. So let's say, let's take example of continuous inverse class F PA mode. And one thing which I would like to, before explaining this graph, I would like to point out here is there have been a lot of papers on waveform engineering. Sometimes uh, things can be misleading because we cannot just randomly shape voltage or randomly shape current. So for example, in class J, we do voltage shaping and not current shaping. Why? The reason for that is my current is already hitting IMAX all the time because it's a class B current. But inverse class F, I showed you in previous slides that inverse class F current is significantly lower than the IMAX of the device, which means that it gives me room to shape current in inverse class F and not in PA modes like class B or class F. So here, what I'm showing is if I go and tune my second harmonic load near open, and enter into continuous class FPA mode, second harmonic source variation is also consistent, which means that if I am designing a broadband match in an area in like yellow and dark yellow region, I should not be worried about anything. You know, it gives me like that um, immunity. It, it, it gives us um, um, immunity to fight against COVID basically which is like the input nonlinearity in this case. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I have, uh, uh, I can achieve really, really high efficiency all throughout my band. So these are some measured gain um, and efficiency profiles for different termination. Uh, I mean, we can go a lot into the, these data, but the, I'm explaining this through charts that uh, we can, uh, of course, all this is related to gamma and phi two, which we talked about. So, so for continuous inverse class F, when we are doing a broadband design uh, near open, uh, the, the input nonlinearity phenomena is also consistent. Next. But, you know, every good thing comes with more problems. Uh, there is no end to, you know, like uh, that, oh yeah, this is the best thing and we know exactly now what we have to design. So uh, I'm sorry, the, the legends are missing in that figure. I. Uh, uh, Vince, is it a PDF or is it PPT? It's a PowerPoint, yeah. Okay. Uh, so here, uh, what the figure first figure is showing, uh, red curve is uh, class C. Uh, blue curve uh, is basically uh, my, um, um, you know, class J, class B, class F. All these classes we know shows nice AM, AM profile, you know, and that's what we want because for advanced modulated um, architectures, I don't want my AMAM to be bumpy. So it will be a big, big problem when we go to systems like digital pre distortion and it will be super, super hard to linearize such systems. So this phenomena was first time predicted by our work um, on, um, um, on the double inflection characteristics. Uh, it's very interesting that in inverse class F, unlike other PA modes, there are double inflection phenomena which happens due to which my AMAM is very, very bad. And people have made this comments uh, comments uh, in the past that the uh, the basically the um, AMAM um, uh, the the inverse class F is a saturated amplifier, which means that inverse class F is good for application which doesn't require any uh, P3DB, for example, compression. 
uh, idea. So people use it for applications like you know heating or for other applications like uh, which are non non cellular. So uh, the point here is that uh, if what I have shown in the previous slides is true, that you know which I was saying that yeah, inverse class F gives immunity uh, to its nonlinearity. Then when I sh uh, I show this slide to you guys, then it means that you know this is just terrible because this is this PA cannot be used for cellular application. So when we discovered it, we also me have measured this, and this is also uh, shown in the um, uh, in the basically in the uh, in the simulations. So if you go next, uh, Vince. So any model you take, uh, there are different models uh, available equation-based models, whether it is Pedro's, a Yang model, a Fager's model, and you try to make your own device, like current source model, all of them consist, consistently shows terrible AM, AM profile for inverse class F or inverse class F like PMO, which means that if I'm tuning near open, you know, uh, I will definitely get bad AM, AM characteristic. Unlike class B, you know, if you see the gray curve, it's nice and smooth, there is a soft gain expansion and then gain, uh, gain compression happens. But for other PA modes like inverse class F, you know, these are very bad AMM. And it also means that my P3, P3, uh, P3 dB efficiency will be really, really bad here because, uh, because uh, just because of the AMM uh, phenomena, I, when I splice this data, my efficiency will be lower than the peak efficiency. I might get very high peak efficiency, but my P3 dB efficiency will be very bad. And we, we don't want that for cellular application. So what's the reason for this? And what's the solution to overcome that? That I will be showing in the next slide. So uh, Link, uh, the, Vince, can you play this animation first? So uh, what this animation is showing, uh, which I think is very uh, interesting that the AM AM for the red curve is, is bad. You know, it's going under 10 dB compression. And if you look at the load line for red curve, stop, can you, okay. So if you see the red line for the uh, load line for the red curve and this, uh, the red, uh, red curve hits the knee region very early in power range. Which means if you go back, yes, go back. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So which means that for red case, my load line is hitting my knee region at a very early power. And blue curve on contrary shows the normal compression phenomena and hit, it hits my knee region at the higher power level. So what does this mean? This means that we know the compression starts when load line starts hitting the knee region, right? This is like the basic understanding of the load line interaction with the knee region. So in the blue curve, that compression starts at high power level, which we are used to seeing and we know for class B, class AB amplifiers. But for inverse class F, my knee hits the, uh, my, my, my load line hits the knee region even at lower power levels, which is terrible because it means that my, de my device is always under compression for inverse class F. So this phenomena, we understood it, we mathematically predicted it, but now the beauty is that by input gamma and phi two, I can change this phenomena, I can change where my load line will actually hit knee region, and it's the same PA at the output, but by changing input nonlinearity and playing with the input nonlinearity, I can change the same PA from red curve to the blue curve. And my efficiency will be, again, uh, it shows less than 3 dB compression. My efficiency will be really good. And I don't have to worry about any inflection in my AMM curve because when I will take this, take this part and design like a Doherty, my, I don't want any bumps or any kinks in my AMM profile. So input harmonic tuning actually helps in AMM enhancement and we have shown this extensively and this animation, people find it very interesting. We presented it, uh, my colleague, Jeff Roberts, uh, he presented it last year in, in um, IMS and a lot of people had requests. So I posted it publicly on my LinkedIn page and you can, you can uh, download it from there if you want. So if you go next, so, uh, so yeah, like this, this, is, this is the interaction which happens and which changes the 
idea of how how things happen in inverse class of mode next Vince. so uh with this i mean with this the fundamental idea um and explaining all this input nonlinearity phenomena um, uh, this is what I wanted to share today with you guys. And uh, Vince might be talking about some of the PAs we have designed at high power, low power, um, I mean, uh, and at even millimeter wave uh, here, where we are applying all these phenomena. So uh, on the left hand part, low power more, uh, low power, which is 40 dB and which is like three 10 watt uh, PA modes, which is very um, popular in academia. Uh, you know, uh, Crete and what uh, device we have used here and we have, we are showing uh, reasonable bandwidth, but then we have been doing a lot of waveform engineering for high power application for 50 dBm and more. And we are able to pretty much match our theory, our load pool and our performance of the, of the, of the parts uh, using that. And similarly for MMICs, uh, we are playing up with this uh, input output harmonics and applying those principles to basically achieve high efficiency and uh, 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 and the high performance uh, using the understanding of simultaneously input and output design. So with that, I will I think I will hand over it to Vince and he will talk about talk some about uh, some of the focus stuff uh, which he they have been he has been working on lately. Yeah, thank you, uh, Tushar. Uh, very good explanation, thorough explanation of these uh, you know principles. Uh, and, and like I mentioned earlier, you know, uh, we've had a lot of people, customers, you know, tuning second harmonic on the input for years uh, with a very basic understanding or, or, or not understanding the concept at all of what the effects were. They saw the, the end result, but couldn't really uh, wrap their mind around it. Uh, I remember we presented the, this paper at European Microwave last year. And uh, before that, that presentation, I had a talk with uh, Paul Tasker. So his, his category of people that can understand that I think is limited. He, he was able to wrap his mind and understood this very well. I think most people kind of do it uh, trial and error kind of a thing. And here's an, just a quick example. Here's a, a measurement we did on the right of a second uh, F0 load pull we did and looking at harmonics. And you can see that the efficiency here the difference from the maximum to the optimum points like 39.9 to like 41 so you get like roughly one to two percent variation so you know this is the typical customer that does this you know wants to optimize the efficiency of his pa and only gets a few points of efficiency but then when he starts tuning the source impedance uh you know he gets a huge variation you know now we're you know if we look at the max you see 41 versus 42 so that's maybe not a huge increase but you can see that if you're not careful you could hit very very uh, you know, deep, uh, you know, points where that you, you're, you basically kill your efficiency significantly. So now, and this is an example with this, a measurement we did at fundamental 30 uh, gigahertz. So this is a second harmonic tuning at 60 gigahertz. So, you know, we're seeing this more and more, not just at the, you know, two, three gigahertz uh, application, but at the millimeter wave uh, as well. So again, we're, uh, we're kind of a bit of above our time now. So I'll just go you know, quickly about this. But again, th these are topics we've covered a bit yesterday, but here are two simple examples of like an 18 gigahertz and the 67 gigahertz system. So you see here that the main difference that you've seen is this phase reference. So obviously we, we, we can't just use a, ve a normal vector um, uh, system, we need a vector receiver uh, system to look at the A and B waves and characterize them adequately, but you also need a phase calibration in the setup. So again, if we look at a live setup, what this looks like, we showed this yesterday. So this is like a 0.8 to 18 gigahertz system uh, that basically controls not only the fundamentals, but the harmonics as well. Same here with uh, the, you know, this is an example of a 10 to 67. So if you want to do like, uh, you know, 5G, uh, design where you're actually tuning at like 28 gigahertz and controlling the harmonic up to 56 gigahertz in some cases higher well in this case you could do it with these these kind of setups where you have harmonic tuning both on the input and on the output with passive tuners and again it all ties in together with what we call this phase reference and basically what this does basically this is a, is a pre-calibration that we do at the factory and it basically co correlates the difference between the phase variation between the fundamental and the harmonic frequencies so we do this this calibration ahead of time and then we, we ship it to the customer and then there's just calibration steps to to, to make this uh, right so then when we actually measure the a and b wave all of it is correlated and makes sense 
So for example, you know, this is uh, taken from uh, Keysight's uh, uh, PNAX um, data sheet, but basically just gave, kind of gives you an example. We stimulate uh, the, the device that's inside the phase reference, me measure the response, and as you can see over time, here there's an example of one, and this is the phase vari variation over multiple hours. So we do this long time calibration and, and, and see what, what the, the variation is uh, in, in that phase uh, uh, variance. So, and at the end, what this allows us to do is when we do all these load pull and power sweeps, it allows us to gather tons and tons of data, and then we can slice this data and actually look at the, the current and waveform uh, as, as we move along and, and select the, the, you know, the, 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 the impedances, the combination of impedance that will allow us to, to hit these kind of uh, waveforms uh, that, that will de de define the, the class of operation and, and get us to, to the, you know, these uh, phenomenons and, and, and theories that, that can be applicable in, in real life designs. So again, we're a bit, we're maybe five minutes past our time. So, uh, you know, I want to open it up for Q&A. So uh, I guess uh, Remy's been uh, monitoring the, the, the session there. So maybe, um, um, Roland, you could uh, open up uh, uh, Remy's mic so to see if we, if we can tackle a few questions there.